There were several problems in the ex excavator's methodology, uh, foremost among which was that they dug straight through to the earliest layers without really paying much attention to the stratigraphy, which is understandable because um, they were excavating ra rather early on. This means, however, that we lost quite a lot of archaeological data. What they did find was that the sanctuary had four main phases. The site was first used as a geometric necropolis, which went out of use around 800 BC and had around 40 to 44 tombs. Not long after that, however, in the late geometric or early archaic period, the site was used as an open air sanctuary from which we have votive deposits containing primarily bronze offerings. And you can see these bronze offerings at the National Archaeological Museum where they have two entire display cases uh, in the bronze rooms. The bronze room. um, during the late archaic period, however, the votive shift from primarily bronze to predominantly terracotta figurines, almost all of which were female. It was during this time that the first temple may have been built on the sanctuary. It is impossible to determine the dimensions of the archaic temple as the later temple is built on top of it. The architectural remains of the late archaic temple, however, are still visible in uh, the foundations of the later temple. And over here we see sixth century column drums built underneath uh, the later temple. Uh, during the 4th century BC, the archaic temple was destroyed and a marble hecatompodon, a 100-foot building, was built on top of it. We only have the foundations of the east facade of the temple, and that is what we see over here. And we also have a few architectural remains from the superstructure, but we have enough of the remains to be able to safely date it to the 4th century BC. The sanctuary, however, was not completely excavated, so we do not completely understand the sanctuary's complete history. Eric Esty uh, reconstructed the temple with roughly 100 by 50 Doric feet and 6 by 12 columns. We unfortunately do not have evidence for the interior of the temple because uh, they were, the blocks were reused in modern buildings. The temple has similarities with other 4th century temples in Greece, such as the Temple of Apollo <coughs> at Nemeos in Thebes, the Temple of Zeus at Nemea, the Temple of Asclepius at Messini, and the Temple of Athena at Ilion. Excavations of the Parian Sanctuary have been recently resumed by the Yota Gama and Korea, and they have found a new geometric building northwest of the temple. They found a new uh, votive deposit. They found a late Hellenistic or Roman building. And they found a section of wall that might indicate that the sanctuary was enclosed by a parabolic wall. This sanctuary was originally identified by Yves Bequignon, who uh, was one of the who's the director of the French uh, part of the dig, as the sanctuary of Zeus Stavlios, because some of the inscriptions dedic were dedicated to Zeus Stavlios in the sanctuary, such as this one. However, scho recent scholarly opinion has shifted in favor of Venodia being the main deity in the sanctuary because the dedications in the sanctuary are more numerous uh, to Venodia and the votive offerings seem to indicate that the main deity was female. Uh, the nature of the votives from the earliest to the latest periods seems to me to indicate a continuity in cult. The votives from the first phase onwards were, de were mostly dedicated to a female deity and they were mostly dedicated by women. There are a total of 3,739 bronze objects that were collected from the first phase of the sanctuary, 48% of which were fibulae that were often associated with women's clothing. <coughs> and here are some of those fibulae from the National Archaeological Museum. Um, although most of these could have been worn by women, um, a certain uh, Yanis Yorganas uh, points out that some of these were, uh, were simply too large to be worn by mortal women. Um, this one over here is about this big. I'm not going to wear that on the shoulder. Um, these may have been associated with the peplos of the cult statue. In addition to the bronzes, there were also two clay figurines depicting uh, female figures dating to the late geometric period, and these may have been depicting images of the goddess. And aside from the fibulae, many of the other bronzes were women's ornaments, such as pendants, hair loops, jewelry, bracelets, pins, rings, we have a few weapons, such as bronze daggers, that were dedicated on the site, but they were not substantial. Most of the other objects were animal figurines, mostly birds and horses. The predominance of women's objects indicates that more women were leaving votives here than men in the first phase. And as I mentioned before, in the second phase, during the later cake period, almost all the votives were terracotta figurines of women dating from the 7th century to the 8th century BC, and they were depicting goddesses. Um, how do we know that? Because they were wearing the polos on their head uh, to, 
sort of cylindrical pad that was associated with goddesses. During the classical and Hellenistic period, the majority of the votive offerings we have from the site are inscribed votive stele. Enodia was the most attested deity in the sanctuary of inscriptions. Many of the inscriptions simply state the name of Enodia, but some contain the names of the dedicants, such as this one where uh, someone named Alexivia uh, dedicated uh, this daily to Enodia Korelos. We have more names for women than for men in the sanctuary, again echoing the same pattern as the previous phases. I would say that this makes it highly likely that there is a continuity in cult throughout the sanctuary's history. If this were true, then the earliest votive deposits at this site are the earliest evidence we have for the cult of Enodia. And despite its locations just outside the city walls, this was the main sanctuary of Pharaoh. Not only was it the largest sanctuary in the city and with the largest temple in all of Thessaly, it was the place in which decrees of the city and its financial accounts were published. These included inscri inscriptions dealing with proxy, which is uh, the listing of foreign delegates, asylum, tax exemption, and also lists of the city's ex expenses. These were not published on the Acropolis. These were published on the in the sanctuary of Enodia. Chrysostomus suggested that the cult originated as an ancestor cult on the geometric necropolis, but we really don't have any good evidence for it since the stratigraphy has been lost and we don't know the connection between uh, the geometric necropolis and the sanctuary on top of it. Before we go on, what did this goddess look like? In Odia's iconography becomes standardized in the early 5th century BC. Prior to that, she seems to have been syncretized with Artemis in Thessaly, and because of this, Enodia is almost identical in iconography to Artemis Phosphoros, Artemis with the torches, um, and to Hecate, who was sometimes equated with Artemis. Enodia was depicted as a woman carrying one or two torches. In this case, she's just wearing a, one big one, and sometimes accompanied by a hunting dog. Uh, the main difference between the goddesses is that Enodia is almost always depicted either on a horse or with a horse. Hecate is never depicted on a horse. Uh, furthermore, Enodia is never depicted as a virgin, that is, with a short chitin, like Artemis is wearing here. Uh, Enodia is also never depicted in triple form, which was common for Hecate, whose statues were often three-bodied. But what was Enodia the goddess of? Previous scholars who have discussed Enodia have made assumptions that Enodia was a goddess of witchcraft. On the screen is the evidence from Thessaly that we have for Enodia's con connection with witchcraft. That is not a broken slide. That is 100% of the evidence that we have. There is zero evidence from Thessaly regarding Enodia's connection with witchcraft. The only evidence we have for, for this is actually from Attic literature, none of which directly refer to Enodia. Chrysostomu also believes that Enodia was originally a frightening underworld deity, but the only evidence for this is the location of a Pharaoh sanctuary on top of a necropolis, which may not have had anything to do with the sanctuary on top of it. And Odia has Kathonic aspects. Uh, we see this in the iconography with the torches and the dogs. Uh, but that does not make her a frightening underworld goddess. Uh, from the earliest phase in her sanctuary to the latest, she seems to have been a benevolent and probably chorotropic deity. The name in Odia might indicate that she was a goddess of roads because her, little, her name literally means in the road. N and the boss, Enodia. Her name was spelled three different ways, sometimes just as one N, sometimes two Ns, and in uh, lyric poetry, she's spelled with an E-I instead of an E-I. <coughs> Chrysostomo believes that, in, uh, believe, sorry, Denver Granier points out that we have yet to see any archeological correlation between her cult and Rhodes. So to find out what her roles were, uh, I want to turn to the epigraphic evidence, which provides us with a large number of epithets for Enodia. These epithets give us an idea of why she was worshipped. And many of these epithets indicate that Enodia was widely worshipped as a kurotropic divinity. Um, kurotropos is someone who uh, took care of the young. And she, that she was connected to the protection of the family and especially of uh, uh, children. Two of her epithets 